behind me is a cartoon of a developing human embryo. Until the really recent last few weeks, an embryo could survive outside the human body only until about the 14th day. So it could divide so-called in vitro in a test tube, in a laboratory, up to the point of two weeks. And at two weeks, tissues start to differentiate. And so that became the standard, the policy, the, the rule by which the world agreed to allow human embryos to grow outside the human body, 14 days. And the map of the world and the regulations around what could be permitted look like this. The rule was created by the limits of technology, plus what we took to be a moral boundary. As an embryo begins to divide to the point where tissues start to differentiate, maybe there's something different about that outside the body, and we shouldn't allow it to go further. That was the case, policy around the world, international consensus, until this year, until 2016, when two groups were able to grow embryos past that 14-day limit outside of the body. And so calls have been in the literature for extending the 14-day limit. Why should we stop when technology allows us to go further? Lots of science can be learned. Lots of uh, advantage for how we treat couples who have infertility could be had by going past that 14-day limit. But what is the morality of growing embryos past the point of tissues beginning to differentiate? So there's no longer a technological boundary, and we didn't really create a hard moral boundary, and so we're in the point of our history related to embryo research where there really isn't a clear rule. Here's a photograph of a human embryo. So I showed you a cartoon a minute ago. This is actually a highly magnified photograph of a three-day-old embryo, just a few divisions after fertilization. Egg and sperm come together, that makes one, divides once into two, twice into four, one more time into eight. That's an eight-celled embryo behind me, about three days after fertilization. It's being held by that red pipette in place so that the smaller pipette can be inserted and a, and a single cell removed from that developing embryo. This is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It's a biopsy, effectively, of a very early stage embryo. Again, in vitro, outside of the body. What's the point? This can be used and has been used, again, since the 1990s in this case, to do genetic testing of an embryo prior to implanting it into a woman's body, to identify the embryos that might be diseased and avoid implanting those, used very widely for families that know that they're at risk of passing on diseases like cystic fibrosis. And so that's what it was used for in the late 80s until the middle, late 1990s, because we didn't really think about other kinds of applications. Create embryos in the laboratory, by in vitro fertilization, and then test them and decide which ones to put in. You are identifying some of the disease characteristics in embryos and implanting only those that are free of that disease. Not changing anything, just identifying what's there. So the, the limits of our ability to think past what the use of that technology could be put to, the, the limits of our ingenuity really, created a rule of sorts. Fast forward. A family in Minnesota by the name of Jack and Lisa Nash had a child. His name is Molly. Molly is sitting in her parents' lap there. Molly suffers from something called Fanconi anemia, passed to her by both of her parents. Her parents are carriers of that disease mutation, but they don't have it. They both passed on that mutation to their first child, Molly, and she was born with that disease. That disease caused her to have leukemia at the age of seven years old. You see her behind me, she's at seven years old, sitting at the Mall of America. 
what was then called Camp Snoopy, now, now called, I think, SpongeBob Square Pants Park or something to that effect. <laughs> they decided to use a technique I showed you before, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, to identify embryos that didn't have the same genetic disease as their daughter, Molly. And they did that so that they would implant an embryo for their next, that would become their next child that wouldn't have that disease. But they did one more thing. This is where the ingenuity came in. They said, as long as we're doing that, avoiding our next child having this disease, let's make sure that that child could also help save our daughter's life. So they did a genetic test on the embryos that were negative for that disease to see which ones were genetic match to their daughter Molly. So the cord blood from that baby could be used to transfuse Molly and cure her of her leukemia. So a stem cell transplant from the umbilical cord blood of the baby that was born from that technique. That baby is sitting in Molly's lap, and his name, I kid you not, is Adam. <laughs> Adam Nash. Here's a picture of Molly and Adam together back home in Denver, Colorado, where they now live, quite happily ever after. This happened in 1999 and 2000. It's made into a book, which many of you, I'm sure, have read, called My Sister's Keeper. A little different outcome in the book, if you've read it, made into a not-so-great movie. Um, <laughs> the point is, turned into a novel, but based on a true account. In the book, I'll ruin it for you, there are two daughters rather than a daughter and a son, and the, the, old, the younger daughter becomes a parts factory for her older sister. Not what happened in the Nash case, but one could see that going forward. So never underestimate human ingenuity. We need to make rules so that we allow the good kinds of human ingenuity, but not the ethically questionable applications. Making policy. So how do we do this? There are um, real problems in making policy around cases like this, because we have a ban in this country on the use of any federal funding, any dollars from us as taxpayers, that is used in research that causes harm or destroys a human embryo, which seems like a reasonable policy, born out of the abortion debates of the 1970s and avoiding what's called sometimes the dirty hands problem. I don't want my money being used in ways that I deem to be ethically unacceptable. So to avoid that problem, we just don't allow taxpayer dollars to be used in research like that. It's had an effect of not allowing us to do much research in human developmental biology, so we don't learn things we otherwise might, but at the same time, it, it doesn't allow us to control the science, because in this country, somewhat unusually, with research dollars come research rules, and when you do things with private money, you don't have to follow those research rules. So, we have all sorts of challenges when it comes to not only how we fund research, but how we fund applications like the ones I just mentioned to you. Turns out the Nashes had to pay for that all out of pocket. And that's because in most states in this country, insurance policies don't cover IVF. And they certainly don't cover it for uses like the Nashes put it to. And so when there's not third-party payer oversight, there are not rules made about what's acceptable and what's not. All of this plays into the stem cell research debate we've been having and leads us to this problem, right? It's a kind of perfect storm. We don't have rules, and we've got strong incentives to do things to get around whatever rules there might be. Move forward. This is very recent science. It's a cartoon that will be very hard for you to see. The point of it is, for women who have something called mitochondrial DNA disease, they pass on very severe genetic illness, not in the nuclear part of their genome. If you think of it as a chicken egg, not in the yellow part in the yolk, but it turns out there's a little bit of DNA in the white part, in the cytoplasm. It's called mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria make energy for our cells. And so, for women who have mitochondrial DNA disease mutations, the only kinds of of offspring they can have will be kids who have those kind of mitochondrial DNA diseases. And so to combat that, people have figured out through, again, very fancy manipulation of eggs or embryos, taking the donor 
cytoplasm and taking the DNA from the woman who's got nuclear DNA, the woman who's got the mitochondrial disease, and putting them together. So DNA from two women, effectively. Nuclear DNA from the woman who wants to be the mother, cytoplasmic mitochondrial DNA from the woman who's a donor, putting that together, sperm from the man, and you get an embryo. The problem is you've also got DNA from two women and one man. Never before in human history has that been possible. And not only are you manipulating, changing the DNA of that offspring, but those changes will be inherited by future generations. We're making changes in the germline, which has been a boundary, a barrier, again, posed by technology. But now, there is no boundary. The FDA in this country, the Food and Drug Administration, which oversees, controls new drugs, devices, biologics, has said that they were willing to accept proposals for licensing this technology under very strict rules. The Congress prohibited that from happening in its last budget bill. FDA may not receive such license applications because it was deemed to be creation of an embryo that would have heritable genetic change, germline change, not acceptable. So the lesson from this, as you'll see in a second, is that a prohibition like that may seem like a strong rule, but in fact is more like no rule at all. Just announced in the last few weeks, baby born in Mexico. American scientists went to Guadalajara to do the technique that I just showed you. Why? Because, as it says on the slide behind me, there are no rules in Mexico. So we went there to avoid the prohibition in the United States. Prohibition pushed people to go abroad. You might say, well, that's not such a big deal. There's very few women in the world who have mitochondrial DNA disease. Announced even more recently, two women in Kiev used this technique not for mitochondrial DNA disease, but because they had advanced maternal age, couldn't get pregnant, they were infertile, used this technique to boost their ability to have children. Many, many more women in the world might opt for that. So, prohibitions or bans sometimes push people to avoid the rules. Lastly, set of techniques, technologies, CRISPR, Cas9 is one that's been in the news a lot, Tayland is another, zinc finger technology, these are all tools to edit our genetic makeup. Not test for it, but edit it, change it. Editing our humanity, what makes us human, the traits that we carry. Just announced in the last few weeks that a researcher at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden used CRISPR, one of these techniques, to modify human embryos. Never had been done in a viable human embryo, only had been done in non-viable human embryos up to that point. Nature, premier journal, asked a question about whether it was time for another Asilomar. Asilomar is a very famous conference in the world of science policy, where the first recombinant DNA techniques were discussed in the 1970s, and the scientific community said, we will not do certain things. By consensus agreement of the professionals, it won't work today. In 2016, the scientific community is too diverse, too broad, and too democratic. Bento is a company that offers you portable, over-the-web kits to do genetic technology, sometimes called garage science. So where are we? The new biology, as I've talked about, requires new rules. It's time to start making them. Thanks.